Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. For hanging out, welcome to it, a Tuesday edition, Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, we're loaded up today. Room for you, as always. Mitch Sherman in about 15 minutes. In hour two, we'll kick it off with Paul Meyerberg with USA Today College Football. Good story yesterday on Matt Rule, a name that's recently on the radar. A lot of Nebraska fans are not down with Rule, not O'Doyle Rules, but uh, Matt Rule, uh, formerly of the Carolina Panthers. We'll hear from Paul Meyerberg and then Tom Deanhart, Purdue Insider, get to join us in the 5 o'clock hour. Yes or no? Time for Ethan Piper? Yes. Okay, Ethan Piper, pride of Norfolk Catholic, is going to be with us at 540. We had a chance to sit down with him at the press conference today. We'll have some Mickey Joseph thoughts as Nebraska gets ready for Purdue. Numbers to get in can join us today at 466-3776-4663776-800-825-5865. You can email the show, Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Give us a follow on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. And as always, watch the show stream us on, on Hale Varsity's Twitter feed, Hale Varsity Radio's Twitter feed at HVarsity Radio. Also streaming on ESPN Lincoln, Facebook, and Twitter. So I, I think there's two groups right now. There's two groups. There's those interested in the coaching carousel. There's those interested in the season with Mickey at the helm. They can converge. They can kind of cross over. But right now, I think a lot of Nebraska fans have moved from, all right, who's out there for the coaching job to, okay, here's Mickey and holy hell, Nebraska's 2-0. and in the last, they're still alive, right? Nebraska is still alive like everybody else in the Big Ten West, not named Northwestern. That's a bit of a surprise to some that Nebraska football's still alive. But it's a credit to Mickey, the job he's done, and uh, the fact that they've got a chance Saturday night. The lines between 11 and 14, wherever you make book or whatever casino you hit, you can get points in Nebraska, points aplenty. It'll be much more ruckus because it is actually sold out in West Lafayette Saturday night under the lights versus Rutgers. We don't know what's going to travel for Nebraska. We don't know what, what offense is going to travel. Will the run game get on the bus and off the bus this Saturday night? Will there be pass protection for Casey Thompson? Uh, you do know Palmer can get deep, and that's a great thing. You know, the defense has been able to adjust. There's actual confidence in this football team, and they're ready to make their feelings known. Uh, can't jack around and have too many missed tackles. Got to get home and put some hits on a quarterback that's still dinged up a little bit in Aiden O'Connell. It can all happen. This story can continue to be a story, the story of Mickey Joseph in 2022, with the, uh, the opportunity that's at hand. And you're an underdog. That's a great story. Go beat a team as a double-digit underdog and seize a spot in the West where you are being hunted, as Mickey talked about. Illinois, Minnesota, elimination game. Illinois comes to Lincoln. Big, huge, could be a night ball game. But what do you do against Purdue? Nebraska's got it in front of them. And realistically, have we decided what the number is going to be for the Big Ten West? What wins this division? Is it six and three? Is it five and four? Is it seven and two? I mean, there's a whole lot of schedule left and a whole lot of death marching to do because it is round robin. 
You know how beat up Nebraska is. You know how beat up Purdue is. Illinois may or may not have their starting quarterback. You saw what happened to Minnesota when Abraham went down. There's Minnesota that looked great two weeks ago, and now you're like, hmm, I'm going to hold. What about Wisconsin? Jimbo, Lenny. Lenny came in there and, and whacked a really bad Northwestern team. How bad does Northwestern look now compared to week, week zero? They're a shell of themselves. Well, you could also go the other way and say, how much better does Nebraska look than they did week zero? Absolutely. 180. 180, and that's because of Mickey, that's because of Bush, that's because of the kids. And uh, Matt chimes in, Elijah, you should give up shaving and grow a full untrimmed beard until the first day of summer 2023. We would have to throw some of those, uh, those, those Christmas trees you hang from your rear view. Oh, yeah. In studio. In studio. Well, hang it from my beard. Could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't thinking that. We'll, very, get, you, we'll get you some plaid, an axe, and a beady, and we'll go cut down a pine tree. Uh, Jonathan chimes in, and we can just give Casey some time to throw and create a crease for Grant. No kidding. I don't know if that's going to happen or not for Nebraska Saturday night, because guess what? This is this is a run. This is a run of defenses Nebraska will face that are top 20 in rush defense. Rutgers came in at 18. Fairly certain Purdue's in the top 20. They are, 97 yards a game's all they allow. And then there's Illinois, the number one scoring defense in the country, eight points a ball game. That's not even a double-double good, man. I mean, eight points is it on Bielema. The pig farmer's front four are v- just vicious. Minnesota's good. You got to stop the run and be able to run the football. Nebraska can't right now. Mickey talked about that with the offensive line not being settled. Here's Mickey on that, and uh, you could see a new five. Uh, cut three. Would should say offensive line. The week, you know what, what we need to do to win the game. You know, if we need them to run block to win the game, they're going to run block. But if they, we need them to pass block, they need to pass block. And they, they just got to continue to work. But, you know, my thing is I think that they're really good run blockers, but they also can pass block also. You know, we've been getting a lot of blitz. They've been heating us up a lot the last two weeks. So we, we're, doing a be- we're going to do a better job this week of, of, of ironing out the protection to give them some help. Good, good comments by Mickey. And we'll – here a little bit more in a moment. We'll get to your calls as well. But to me, that's it, right? Like Saturday night's totally winnable, and I'm not, I'm not making fun of, of of the old feud between Nebraska and Purdue about winnable game. I'm not, I'm, I'm not being smug that way. But it is. It is winnable if you can get some balance offensively, if you can get some protection, if you can get your run game going. Purdue's run game was garbage last year, but they stuck with it. For the sake of sticking with it, they averaged three point whatever a carry, but it was dangerous enough to to win a, a ball game. They had you know, they were plus four in the turnover margin by five last year. Purdue's been good. Purdue's confident. Momentum, man, that's the theme of Saturday night because both teams have it. Well, and you you mentioned the fact that that oh Purdue didn't have a great rushing offense last year good but enough when they needed it they got it and i think the best way to put it is the fact that the big 10 and especially the big 10 west is just a week-to-week league where you, you can't look well nebraska didn't have much rushing attack against Rutgers, so it means bad things against purdue here's the thing is it that's com- the thought that- it, it comes down to matchups in the big 10 west and i think we see that every single week whenever two especially big 10 west teams step on the field with each other as you go well wisconsin couldn't run the ball against illinois so it means uh, big problems whenever they face insert team name here that's not how it works in the big 10 west and that's why i think a lot of husker fans have learned over the past couple years is every week is a dogfight and every single matchup is different despite the fact that purdue might have one of the best rush defenses in the big 10 west it doesn't mean that they're not going to have that occasional game where the wheels fall off because either nebraska or whichever team you want to insert has a good game plan for them uh, or an offensive lineman matches up well with one defensive lineman takes them out of the game and it completely throws off purdue's rushing defense it's a week-to-week league I mean, it's like that just about everywhere, but especially so in the Big Ten West where sometimes you have to throw previous results out the window just because it comes down to individual matchups and it could come down to something as simple as, well, this tight end blocks this defensive end really well, even though that 
this defense has been playing well all season long. And I know I'm being pretty general here, but that's just the, that's that's the way of the, the Big Ten is. West. That's it's the way of the Big Ten West. It, everything changes on a week-to-week basis in the Big Ten West, and that's why Mickey and, and his staff always echo the point of just go 1-0 this week. And that's a coach-speak thing to say, but it's, it's especially true. true in the Big Ten West. It doesn't matter how pretty it looks. It doesn't matter how ugly it looks. All that matters at the end of the day is that you get a win. And if Ratska gets a win with no rushing attack whatsoever against Purdue on Saturday... It doesn't matter. You'll they, take they got it. the win. I have a hard time believing that happens. Sure. But for the sake of argument, you're right. It is a week-to-week thing. Who's on the horn with us? We have Chris on the line. Chris, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Hey, guys. I think, uh, you know, Mickey's done a, a, a good job, you know, focusing the team and, and getting them to actually practice um, like a real football team. But the offense has been awful since he took over. Uh, we've really uh, we're averaged about 16 points a game, really, when you look at it, because only scored 28 offensively against Indiana. Really, only scored seven against Oklahoma. They had their fourth string defense in, and they're a horrible defense. It's to a begin far with. cry from the 35 um, a game you were averaging. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, 14 points against uh, uh, Rutgers. You know, so we scored basically 49 points in three games. You know, so. But uh, anyways, that's that's I got. I got to get going. Thanks, guys. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate show. you. Yep. Thanks for listening. Yeah. And guess what? Your your um <laughs> your level of competitions increased quite a bit, right? You, you go from playing Georgia Southern and North Dakota and uh, and Northwestern to Oklahoma. They're in hell right now, but they're what they are. They shouldn't be. Cur- you know, bitten by the Nebraska curse. Maybe they were. And then you, you, you jump into Big Ten play where, okay, Indiana's defense, for the most part, till they, they got finally knocked out by Michigan. It was 10-10 to ball game. Uh, and, and then you have uh, Rutgers, who's been holding a lot of teams to quite a few low-scoring, you know, low probably season-low outputs. So the, the schedule's gotten harder. And that's what you're going to do uh, in in Big Ten play. You're going to you're going to win a lot of ball games if you are lucky enough to win twenty four twenty one. You make a great point. Yeah, no, and and when you look ahead at this Purdue matchup on Saturday, well, let me get your take here. Do you think Purdue has a better defense than than what we saw from Rutgers this past week? I don't think it's better. I think it's probably. I mean, rush wise, they're right there with them. Mm-hmm. Okay, when it comes to what what are you allowed to run the what do they allow you to run the football with? For the sake of balance and keeping Casey away from smelling salts, you need some sort of running game. Even if you are averaging two and a half a carry, you got to keep hammering away, A, for the fourth quarter to finish, right? Be the strongest team in the fourth quarter. It's not a new Nebraska thought. It, it works. Be the toughest man in the bar, right, so to speak. But then get one to pop. Get a big play in the, in the ground game. In Nebraska, I think, with whip, they can figure it out, right? Do they do they go at Purdue with more of a short passing attack, more checkdowns? Those are there, right? You, Grant Grant's gonna need to ice up because he's he's a dude and he is he's a difference maker. And if 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 you check down to him early in the game versus running him running him into the between the tackles versus trying to bounce outside, um, that's your choice. That's what Whip's paid to do. Really talented guy, seen it all, all yada yada yada. But but we, we know but, how. But there's there's ways to figure out what they can't take away and go hit that. And, and I, I think from what I've seen over the past two weeks with this Husker football team, it's the fact that the way that they move the football and the way they get offensive uh, their offensive uh, just scheme going is, is getting the ball in the hands of their playmakers. Whether it's Trey Palmer, Anthony Grant, or Casey Thompson, when the ball's Stop. in one of those three hands. The Nebraska offense is going to do well. It's whenever it's, you know, uh, I mean, as we saw this past weekend, the the defense shutting down Nebraska's rushing attack, and now you got to put the ball in in Casey's hands in the pocket, and and you can throw another defensive back out in the field, and you can really shadow Trey Palmer, and boom, the, the Nebraska offense is struggling. So I'm not saying that you have to go out and, and establish the run early and often. I think you have to have a rushing attack, but if the way you establish a rushing attack is by taking the defense or the top off the defense a few times with Trey Palmer, 
And, and that opens up the rushing attack because now uh, Purdue wants to put a defensive back on the field in order to counter that. Then it opens up more rushing lanes. So I, I think Whipple is going to have a, a good game plan for this game on Saturday. And I'm not saying the, the only way to do that is by rushing Anthony Grant in between the tackles 25 times this game. But I do think you need to have Anthony Grant having 25 plus touches this game. It's a question of how you want to get the ball in his hands and how you want to get the ball in a guy like Trey Palmer's hands as well. Well, and like you got to adjust and adapt to, to what the defense is going to try and take away. That's that's vocal act that uh, maybe a little bit more yant. Maybe it's not. I mean, Nebraska's got the uh, the week to work. Look at what Purdue can do, and what can you get defensively here? We'll get more from Tom Deanhart here in an hour. Paul Meyerberg and then Mitch Sherman is on the way. Numbers to get in, 466-3776 or 800 uh, I, I see lots of Smothers mentions on the stream. Yeah, put in a mobile quarterback and give me some zone read. Hold on to the football if you're the quarterback, but that's all right. You know who concerns me is Durham. Their tight end. Dude's money. He's heating up. The tight end linebacker matchup is uh, problematic. Purdue's always had uh, a good option that way. Uh, you, you know, Purdue's dinged up, though. They are uh, a bit of a walking wounded team. That's why the Big Ten's week to week. But they are they are very tough. Mitch Sherman weighs in on Nebraska-Purdue, on Matt Rule. More of your calls, thoughts, and emails on the way with Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for spending time. Paul Meyerberg, check it in here, USA Today, next hour. We say hi to Mitch Sherman from The Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, how's the wallet today, bud? Uh, are you talking about my auto insurance? No, I'm, I'm saying you, you got a 16 year old, and I just saw on Facebook one gets a car, the other gets braces. Do you need a hug? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I'm referencing, yeah. The 16-year-old has a direct impact on the on the car insurance situation. Um, hey, I've had I've had uh, weeks that were easier um, on the wallet, um, <laughs> but you know that's life. So glad that we're in a position to be able to do this. Uh, big milestones in the Sherman household this week. Mitch, well, can we get reconnected here real yeah, quick? We're, we're we got gonna, a weird crackle yeah, going. We, we got a wonderful phone line in Lincoln. Hang on, Mitch. We're gonna we're gonna recall you, bud. Thank you for your patience on that. So, Elijah's gonna dial him back up, and uh, we will dive into Purdue. We will dive into the Nebraska job with a new name out there in Matt Rule. Emails Chris at Hale Varsity. Dot com, or you can dial up here. Plenty of room. Post Mitch for the uh, first hour till five four six six three seven seven six four six six three seven seven six. We have Mitch Sherman back. Mitch, we've got you connected. But uh, hey, congrats on on the day, and I mean that with uh, with a sixteen year old. I got a month till that happens in our household, and uh, then I will be weeping to you. It's a little frightening. I mean, on top of the other stuff that we mentioned, it's just uh, kind of a scary situation. But, you know, lots of people have been through it and survived, so I think we'll be okay. So let's dive into the the Matt Rule topic before we talk Purdue. And if I were to to put a a meat reference to it, i.e., how do you like your steak, it's, it's kind of medium rare for a lot of at least Nebraska fans you see reacting on social media. There's some no thanks, no way. Uh, there's a few that say absolutely, uh, you know, the, the cool red-pink center, uh, the medium rare cut and, uh, and cook. Matt Rule, to me, is, is wow. Uh, if Nebraska could get him, that'd be super impressive. I guess I fall into the the body of work at Temple and Baylor, and I, enough of it makes me smile. If, if I'm a Nebraska fan, say, man, if Nebraska and Trey can get him, that's big time, taking nothing away from Mickey Joseph. What's your read and feel with Rule uh, as, as a guy that could fit in Lincoln? Yeah, I mean, Mickey Joseph is a wild card in this whole situation. Because if you're against all outside candidates because you, you're, you're not sold on Mickey, um, okay, I, I understand that, and, and I, I think Mickey's done a great job, mm-hmm. too. I, I would caution that he's coached three games, and let's see. The reason that – part of the reason 
that, that Trev Alberts made the change when he did was to give Mickey enough time to have a larger sample size, to have a better sense of what it would be like uh, with him as the permanent head coach and, and, and to allow that to be an option for Trev at the end of it. So I think that's important to mention at the beginning. Um, beyond that, if your reaction to Matt Rule is, uh, and this is just my opinion, anything other than elation that he might possibly be a candidate for Nebraska, if it's anything other than that, if you're, if you're, um, if you're, if you're cold on that, if you're ho hum on that, I would ask, who do you want them to get? Do, do you think that they're in the market for Nick Saban? I mean, is, is Lincoln Riley coming to Nebraska? Because Matt Rule is about as proven of a program builder, of a college head coach that Nebraska, the type of college head coach that Nebraska is looking for as you could possibly find. Not to say that he's the best candidate or will end up being the guy or even has interest in Nebraska. Mm-hmm. But if you as a Nebraska fan look at that, and it's not just, hey, I'm sold on Mickey. If that's, if that's your answer, fine. Okay, you, that, great. But if it's anything other than that and you don't love the idea or you're not excited about the idea of him as a potential candidate, I, I just think you're living in an, in, a, in an unrealistic world because what he did – what he did at, at two schools, um, at Temple. It, it, I mean, Temple was it was just a, a, a trash bin of, <laughs> of a college football program when he took over. And look how he left it. And Baylor was worse coming out of the Art Bryles disaster. And look how he left that. So, uh, you, you know, he, he's, he's uh, an outstanding candidate for – whatever school gets involved with them. And, and, you know, at this point with Nebraska, it's, it's very much up in the air if, if they would even be in the conversation. Um, you know, we have to see where this thing goes. And, and I'd imagine he needs a little bit of time to, uh, to decompress from getting fired in Carolina and to, uh, you know, to assess the, uh, the, the, the land, landscape if, in fact, he does want to go back to college, which, you know, I think eventually he will. He, right now he's doing a snow angel in money. So <laughs> that's the other thing about rule and wherever he goes is, and, and I get that this isn't about Nebraska. Uh, you know, money is m- money is not the, the, the number one concern here. You're not trying to hire someone on the cheap. That's, that's, that's not how Trev Alberts is going into this. They have money to spend, but if you have an opportunity to hire someone for less because they're getting paid uh, 40 million, uh, minus what you pay them as a head coach after being fired by an NFL team, which is the case with Rule, you know you can get him for a, a, a reasonable price. Uh, you know I think he would like to get whatever he could out of the Panthers' ownership after after their decision to fire him two and a half years into a seven year contract, and and you know that would allow for a situation, you know, along the same. Uh, it, it wouldn't not in the same dollar figures, but along the same strategy that Bo Pelini took in signing for a, a small amount uh, relatively relative to what other coaches make when he chose to, uh, to go home to Youngstown state after uh, Nebraska had, had, had fired him. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he, he chose to take the money from Nebraska instead of Youngstown state and rule would have the option to do that with the college program, uh, take less from them and more from the Panthers. Mitch Sherman is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Mitch, we have a couple comments in from our uh, Facebook live stream. Jeff and Matt both chiming in saying they're not convinced that, that Matt Rule's success uh, a, at Temple and also at Baylor is a like-for-like comparison to what you need to go succeed in the Big Ten. So what in your mind uh, from Rule, and I promise we'll get to some, some Nebraska-Purdue thoughts here in just a second, but what from Matt Rule and, and what he built at Temple and Baylor makes you believe that, that his scheme, his system will work in the Big Ten? Well, he's a Big Ten guy. Played at Penn State. Um, you know, he understands the conference. It's not going to be the same challenge at Temple or, or, or at Baylor that it would be at Nebraska. But I, but it's not. I also don't think it's like hiring somebody who is, is unaware of the challenge in the Big Ten. I think he's fully aware of what it would take in the Big Ten. And you know, maybe he chooses to go to a different conference. Maybe he wants uh, to take a crack at the SEC. Um, that that it remains to be seen. We don't know what what Matt Rule is thinking. But to me, he comes he comes across as a Big Ten guy from the state of Pennsylvania, played in the Big Ten. Um, so I, I think he understands it. You know, I, I think that, that 
when you're when you're building a program from the levels from the places that that he took over at both of those schools, um, it translates to to another college program. It doesn't necessarily translate to the NFL. You know, look at what Nick Saban did in the NFL and then came back to college and, and has had a fair amount of success. But look at what at what Chip Kelly did um, in going to the NFL uh, didn't didn't do well and then came back to college and now you're seeing him turn the corner at UCLA. You know, Pete Carroll, there, there are examples all over the place. Um, my, my co-worker colleague, uh, Stuart Mandel, uh, mentioned a, non- a number of these um, yesterday in a tweet that I don't have in front of me, but um, there, there, are, there are all kinds of examples of coaches who haven't had the greatest experience in the NFL had success in college before they went there and then came back and, and were able to, to rekindle that. I think Rule will ultimately fit into that category. And, and, you know, I think the success that he had, albeit at different places, um, will tra- would translate extremely well to the Big Ten. Mitch Sherman's with us from The Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, uh, let's go to Nebraska-Purdue and uh, big ball game. And the fact that it's, it, it is a big ball game at this point in the year after Nebraska's start – says a ton about Mickey Joseph and Bill Bush and this football team. You know, as you look at Nebraska, how can they get it done uh, Saturday night? I mean, let's let's get into the matchup here, specifically the offense, as they've gotten into to tougher competition, mm-hmm. has, has not been putting up the points. Conversely, the defense has been dynamite in the second half. Yeah, who'd have thought we would be in this position four games into the Big Ten season or on October 15th, maybe is a better way to put it, <laughs> where you looked at this team and said, my concern is the offense. You know, I, I, the defense looked like it, it, it was never going to stop being the primary concern uh, about three weeks ago. You know, my inkling at the beginning of the year was to think that this is the way that it would go, that as we got into the season, the offense would be more of a concern and the defense would come along. After watching two or three games, I felt like I was completely wrong in that preseason assessment. So I'll go back, you know, I'll go, and I didn't see it playing out this way. You know, I didn't see um, it playing out where Eric Chenander was, was sitting on, on the sideline watching and you had a new coordinator um, or sitting at home watching, I suppose, in, in, in his case, and you had a new coordinator um, and, and, that's, and that's how it got kick-started. You know, I felt that the Nebraska defense from the beginning had a better foundation, had a better track record of development, and, and that that would play out over the course of the season to, to allow that group to improve. While I didn't know what the offense would do over the course of the season, really that's not the formula that Nebraska's followed. Nebraska tore this thing down. Bill Bush um, and his coaches uh, took a took a new approach. They simplified things. They 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 went all the way back to uh, stressing the importance of just getting lined up, and you know that was a big thing. Um, that was talked about around the, the time of the Indiana game. And, and, and you've seen now Nebraska pitch shutouts in, in two consecutive second halves. So they're holding up physically. They're getting better as the game goes on. They're making adjustments. Um, you know, all credits to the players and the coaching staff for really doing something pretty remarkable with this defense when you consider the, the 642 yards allowed against Georgia Southern. I mean, I, I get that Rutgers is not an offensive juggernaut and, and, and Indiana without two of its best receivers. Um, is not either, but j- to be able to to, to have um, strong performances and carry the team the way that they have the past couple of games is a remarkable achievement. No matter the account- the competition, it's a it's two wins in the Big Ten. It's a win on the road in the Big Ten um, for the first time in in almost two years. Mm-hmm. So all, you know all of these things again. Uh, kudos to to Bill Bush, his staff, and and those guys who are playing defense. Uh, P- Purdue is going to present another challenge. Uh, a different kind of challenge. It's it's at the time that Nebraska played the opponent, and it, because I don't want to say Mitch, this about I got to I got to jump in. I'm so sorry to yeah. interrupt. I'm against a hard break. Good... I don't want to cut you off. Can we finish this on the other side? Yeah, Is that okay? Sorry, I went too long. No, no, you're yeah. good. You're absolutely good. Thanks for hanging in with us. We'll be right back. Mitch Sherman continues with us. Tale of our city. We're presented by Currency. Chime in, 402-466-ESPN, or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me, try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Big thanks. We continue on with Mitch Sherman from The Athletic at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. 
as uh, he is talking Nebraska Purdue. We talked to Matt Rule last segment. Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Hail Varsity Podcast. Check that out. Mitch, I interrupted. Forgive me, good sir. You were talking Purdue Nebraska matchup. Yeah, I. Um, sorry for my long windedness, but <laughs> you're good now. Uh, I, I don't know what, where I left off, but I think my point was made that Nebraska defense deserves a lot of credit for what it's done, and this matchup is a is a different challenge altogether. Uh, Purdue offensively is dynamic. Jeff Brom is is an innovator. And, you know, he's going to have things ready with a six-year senior quarterback who has the grasp, uh, a, a, a great grasp of that Purdue offense. You know, it's not David Bell um, out there. They've lost some of the NFL playmakers um, that, that have carried Purdue or helped carry Purdue in, in recent years. There's no George Karloftis on the defensive side. But I think overall, Purdue on both sides of the ball – is a stronger and, and, and more well-rounded group than, than what Nebraska has seen at any point in the last four or five years. Mitch Sherman with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And Mitch, i got to ask you about Mark Whipple's health concerns. That, that's been a story over the past couple of days, and Mickey Joseph addressed it a little bit this morning. What, what's your take on that? Well, what's, I guess, the concern level for, for Mark Whipple moving forward? Well, we've seen Mark Whipple m- moving around slowly the last few weeks since, since the Oklahoma game. And, you know, I'm not in a spot to be able to speak to what he's dealing with, but, you know, clearly he's got some limited mobility and, and there are some, some health concerns there. And, and, you know, I think it'll probably be a, a week-to-week thing. Um, is he able to come to practice? Is he able to do all of the things that a, a coach needs to do? It's a demanding position to be an offensive coordinator um, at, a, at a Power 5 program, you know, let alone one that's gone through the kind of turmoil that Nebraska has this year. So, you know, let's hope. And, and, hey, I will say this about Mark Whipple. I have really enjoyed getting to to be around him over the last nine months, you know, especially the last two to three months. Um, He's a a breath of fresh air. I would say he's a lot different than what I expected um, from a guy, uh, you know, who was was coming with with his his history. just entertaining, fun to listen to. I think he's got to be fun, fun to play for. So you know, the, the as long as as we get to be around him, and you know, he's out there coaching this offense, um, the better. So wish him the best, and and you know, hope that he's able to uh, you know make it through this whole year. And, and Mitch, quickly, if you have any sort of read. I, I... I have to ask the question just because contingency plans. If there was ever a game that Mark Whipple was unable to, to make it on the sideline because of these these health issues, do you know who would be stepping up and calling plays? Do you have any sort of idea? Well, Nebraska leaned on Steve Cooper last year, who's a, a, not a full-time assistant coach, but he was, I believe, an analyst um, or a quality control coach a year ago. And, and when Matt Lubick was let go with two games left in the season, Cooper stepped up and, and filled that role and, and helped. Scott Frost with the with the play calling. Although Frost, of course, was was doing the majority of it, so there's not necessarily an experienced play caller there, um, you know, outside of Mark Whipple on this offense. But you know, Mickey Joseph would be involved, and, and then Mike Cassano um, also has has been kind of a protege of, of Whipple. Uh, they worked together at, at Miami, um, and then Cassano ended up at Nebraska before Whipple got here, and, and he's the one who stepped up and and coached the quarterbacks. Um, in the with with the absence of, of an offensive staff member after after Frost left the uh, after Frost was let go and, and Joseph became the head coach so between Cassano um, and Cooper and and then Joseph of course is the head coach is going to have input on big decisions um, you know I think they would find a way to get it done but obviously you hope that um, that Whipple is able to uh, to make it through this season. There's there's a guy named Tom that's around the stadium. <laughs> do you put him in? Yeah, the, okay. I, I'm saying just put him in the booth. What do you think? Short side option, third and two. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to open. I'm not going to open I'm that j- can of worms. I, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I had to go but, there. I'm sorry. I had to go, go there. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I, you know what? He probably would come up with some good stuff. I know he would. Mitch, enjoy uh, the day today, and thanks for a few minutes today, bud. All right, thanks, guys. There Take he care. is. There he is, Mitch Sherman. He'll never answer the phone again with the Osborne. Forgive me on that. We'll get to some of your comments, your emails, and a big thanks to uh, Mitch Sherman for joining us. 466 3776 800 825 5865. It is 
as uh, we've kind of deemed it week to week. Jake emails in. He's listened for a while. He's not ever emailed before, but Jake, thank you for emailing. First, uh, not to be negative, but I see Nebraska getting handled this week. Purdue's a damn good football team. Afternoon night games in West Lafayette have taken out 2018 Iowa and Ohio State. 2019 Nebraska, maybe not an upset. And 2021, number five, Sparty. And then they also knocked off Iowa, number two in the country at the time. Now, that was at Kinnick. They are a better football team and program currently. Uh, hope to be in striking distance in the fourth and have a shot by the end. Purdue just executes what accounts probably covers. The biggest question is whether Bush, unlike his predecessor, will take the uh, belichick Saban approach to take out the number one target. Again, this is Jake's email. No ma- coaching, no matter what happens the remainder of the season, Mickey and Billy need to be retained. Incredibly genuine dudes. And uh, not to mention top-notch recruiters and motivators. Don't know if that's possible, but hopefully Trev pulls it off. Last thought here from Jake, email-wise, says his top five, Aranda, Rule, Leipold, Campbell. And for some reason, people are cooling off on him. But I like Bill O'Brien. It's my top target. So good stuff from, uh, from you, Jake. Uh, heartfelt take there that Purdue's just better. They are, hence what Vegas says. But uh, Nebraska, I think they'll be. I think they'll be ready. I think it'll be a four quarter game. And as I said, first segment leading off the show, it's a week to week league. The Big Ten. Yes, I agree. Purdue, based on what they've put down over the past couple of years and what I've seen from them so far this season, they have that ability to go win close football games, to go stick together and uh, and pull it out. And for that reason, I, I do think Purdue probably should be winning this football game against Nebraska with all the upheaval Nebraska's had, but it's a week-to-week league in the Big Ten. Uh, they don't really have PTSD from that close shave against Penn State or Syracuse. They've grown from it. Who's with us? Eric on the line. Eric, thanks for hanging. Go ahead, bud. You bet. Hey, how's it going, fellas? I'm a big fan of the show. Thank you, man. So uh, I got a couple takes that you guys are pretty sure be interested in. Uh, first, on the Purdue game, um, without knowing the spread, I agree with you guys. I think we're definitely in this game. Um, I just actually went to YouTube earlier this morning and watched a little 27-minute highlight of uh, their their first uh, of, of the Purdue and Minnesota game. Mm-hmm. It was the boringest college game I've ever watched. And I, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I swear, I was like, I only got a few minutes left, and I was just trying to tough it out. But we definitely have more talent than both of those teams. They're just well coached. Mm-hmm. Now, hats off to Mickey and and, but, and I agree with the, the email from Jake. Like, you know, those guys are really doing a great job. They still got a, you know, a little over a handful of games to continue to show what they can do. And um, I believe we'll go 7-5. and five. I believe, you know, looking at the lines, I guess we'll lose, a, a, you know, this weekend. I'm guessing the game to Purdue just on the road. We're not quite all the way there ready with being coached up because I believe we always had the talent. It's just the coaching has been the problem for years um, with Riley and Frost in particular and then towards the end of Pelini's regime. Um, I believe we'll lose to Michigan, Purdue, and I believe we'll finally beat Iowa, Wisconsin, and uh, Minnesota uh, nail biters. Couple, couple games. I, so I think we'll go. Seven Eric, five. hang on, hang on for me, Cowboy. Hang okay. on. Okay, okay. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Winding down this first hour, Paul Meyerberg, Tom Dean Hart. Next hour, Ethan Piper going to be with us, Husker O lineman. And uh, we are presented by Currency here on Hale Varsity Radio. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Eric, continue on. Call it your shot the rest of the year. Thanks for your patience. You bet. Yeah, so just I had kind of a couple of takes. The main one was the rest of the year, I believe we'll go 7-5. and five. I believe we'll, we, we, we already have. We'll lose some of the games we thought we should win. We've seen that early on. And I, that'll probably come with this Purdue game. I think we'll win some of the games a lot of folks thought we couldn't, which would be your Minnesota's. I was in Wisconsin, um, and I got us going seven and five. If that's you no, know, don't know if that's going to be enough for Mickey Joseph to grow into the position. It looks like he's doing a good job. You know, I Trevor I was mentioned that early on. I think at a seven and five, it still won't win him the job, but it depends on how it looks and how the, how promising it looks moving forward. That's my take on that. I got to create. I want another take on being creative, more offense and defense. If anybody watched the Chiefs Raiders game last night, they wasn't just getting pressure on Mahomes with the front four, but they were sending slot corners on a blitz, uh, free safeties on a blitz. That stuff works. We got to do it. We haven't done it, you know. And I, hopefully, Bill Bush and them has some of that in their arsenal. Love 
Coach Whip. Uh, this offense has been the best I've seen in a, in a, that we've seen in a while. Um, better than the whole Scott Frost here. That's a whole other story. Um, look, get a little more creative. It's some good balance. I feel sometimes he likes to get a little pass happy. But running back, people are like, well, we're, we're getting 19 carries you know, a game from Anthony Grant. It's got to be more creative wrinkles, running and passing the ball. Mm. So I'd just like to get a little more creativity, uh, creativity on both sides of the ball. And lastly, uh, just a touch up on the coaching. And, you know, I, I think we're all kind of rooting for Mickey. I believe he's going to be the former co- quarterback who can become the, a good head coach for us. But um, if it doesn't happen, a couple years ago I said Urban Meyer – because it's, he's, he's, he's able to take your groceries. I think um, uh, Bill Parcell said, I could take your groceries and, and make a meal. And, and that's the type of coach he is. I know he's got some off-the-field stuff. I know he only stays around for three to four years. But every time he's done it, he's left those programs in pretty good hands. Um, and then uh, I, I like Luke Fickle, somebody who actually coached under him. So that's kind of what I got, guys. Hey, Eric, good stuff, man. Appreciate the the uh, the insight. Thanks for the phone call. And that's not a, a bad uh, list at all. And when we talk about chefs, yeah, Urban's a chef. Might be a crazy chef, <laughs> but uh, he can get it handled. And, and one thing I'll say to Eric's point about, about creativity defensively, I, I like you know bringing cre- uh, blitzes from more creative spots, but this is a defensive staff that said we want to simplify things for the defense, and you're going to complicate the hell to your coverages if you're bringing slot corners on a blitz or uh, short side corners on a blitz, whatever you want to do. You, you're complicating the hell of the defense, but I will agree with him that it's going to be a huge key for Nebraska on Saturday defensively to get after Aiden O'Connell. Make him a little bit worried. He's a guy who's been dealing with an injury uh, over the past couple of weeks, so if you can get in his face and make him uncomfortable, make him get happy feet in the pocket, that means big things for Nebraska because we know Purdue, they like that, that quick a uh, rhythm passing game, and if you can mess up that rhythm and make Aiden, Con- Aiden O'Connell, excuse me, start thinking about where the blitz is coming from. I- I'm not going to say you're going to shut down that Purdue offense, uh, but you could lower their output significantly if you can. I mean, especially getting home with four, but creativity on your blitzes isn't a bad thing either. No, and give me more Tanner up the middle. Loved seeing that last week against Rutgers. Uh, Paul Meyerberg on the way. Reminder about red zone tickets. Selling fun since 2001. Do you have tickets you want to buy or sell? Want to go see Husker football or Husker volleyball, Creighton basketball? How about concert or theater seats? Red Zone tickets. They're local. They're Omaha, and they are A-plus Better Business Bureau rating. 100% guarantee on all authentic tickets for you. Get that item crossed off your bucket list. Create memories that last a lifetime. Do so with RedZoneTickets.com, RedZoneTickets.com. Paul Meyerberg, next hour with Hale Varsity. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back in, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Let's talk some college football, Nebraska, and college football writer and insider with USA Today, Paul Meyerberg with us. Paul, thanks for a few minutes. How's the week been? Uh, thank you for having me. It's been great. Looking forward to a really, really great Saturday of football. I think we got five games with unbeaten top 25 teams, so it should be great. Yeah, it is quite the, the weekend slate, some some implications. Uh, a plenty. Really enjoyed your story yesterday with USA Today on Matt Rule, specifically uh, Nebraska and, and his fit. I want to start there, Paul, with how it could line up and how it would, would work between Nebraska, Trev Alberts doing a national search, and what Rule has done in college. How you see those puzzle pieces fitting together? Yeah, the, everything is working out here. Timing, availability, fit. Um, philosophical similarities between the kind of football rule espouses and coaches and the kind of football that I think Nebraska as a program and a state is hungry for. I'm hard-pressed to say right now that they're going to end up on the dotted line, but um, in a vacuum and looking at this relationship, it's hard for me to find a more perfect fit uh, than that rule in Nebraska and, and knowing rule as I do and, and watching him transform two programs from the absolute depth of uh, Baylor post-sexual assault scandal and Temple being one of the bottom-rung teams in the FBS, he's just perfectly suited for the rebuilding project that awaits Nebraska. So it's going to be a fascinating search. It already has been. Um, if I was Trev Albert, and I'm not, and he gets paid big bucks to be himself, uh, Matt Rule would be a number one on my list. 
you've covered Matt. You've seen him at Temple and Baylor, and and you outlined what he walked into. What what do you think he's walking into in Lincoln from from your national perspective? Yeah, the off the field stuff at Baylor has no analog. So that more than anything was what he had to clean up at Baylor and what he did there. Um, in terms of getting that program back on the straight and narrow and, and also representing that program in a state where everybody's trying to toss dirt on you if you're an FBS rival was extraordinary. Um, but just from the pure X's and O's and personnel, there, there are similarities in terms of what he needs to do to rebuild uh, Nebraska's pipeline of the offensive line, to rebuild a sense of toughness and physicality that's been missing from the program for about a decade. Those are things that I believe he's really equipped to improve right away. And more so than that, I, I just feel like his ability to connect with people, to connect with players, um, may not have suited him well on the NFL level, where it's a very different environment, a different day-to-day work grind, a different um, sort of conversation that you have daily with players compared to college players. But I do think that what he does really well is build that rapport and build that sort of continuity of intent, continuity of purpose. Um, in Texas, for example, I can tell you three or four years later, if you polled 300 Texas high school coaches today and asked them who their favorite coach in football is, I promise you and I guarantee you the majority would say Matt Rule. And that's three or four years down the road, three or four years, and see step foot in that state. That's the kind of relationship he built in that insular community um, to bring Baylor and put them back on the map. So he's very, very smart. He's very intelligent, and he's very well conditioned to embrace this rebuilding process. And you know and all your listeners know from watching him on Saturdays or this past Friday, uh, the intent is there, I think, for Nebraska with Mickey Joseph. I think they play hard, um, but they need someone, in my opinion, who can bring this thing to its fruition and to its final point. It's not just enough to play hard. You have to bring in all the pieces. Uh, Matt's shown an ability to do that at two different stops in two very adverse circumstances. And in comparison, I don't think Nebraska is, is in the same ballpark. Paul Meyerberg with us, USA Today College Football Insider, Hale Varsity Radio. I want to go back to, to Baylor for a moment post Bryles. How did he connect as, as an East Coast guy? And I know his backstory with Penn State and time at UCLA, and he's, he's a guy that has been in the trenches, offensive and defensive line. He's coached about everywhere, but, but the secondary. So he is, he is well-traveled and, and puts all sorts of emphasis on, on how you win in the Big Ten, and that's, that's the lines of scrimmage. How did he get in? As, as an East Coast guy in Texas with those high school coaches? How did he connect when you've got Texas and TCU and A&M and SMU, and I'm leaving probably 40 other schools out, but how did, how did the, air quote, outsider come on down to the Lone Star State and do so well? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I can tell you uh, personally, just from experience, what he did. Number one, um, he hired extremely well. He hired guys who were connected in the state, including Joey McGuire, who's at Texas Tech. And through those relationships, he was able to get entry with these coaches. And that's just the first step. Uh, the second thing he did immediately at the staff is he hit every one of those schools. And it was a priority. It was a priority because he wasn't planning on just winning year one. He was planning on what do we want to look like in year three or year four, and how do we do that? It's like baking relationships with these guys. We may not get the five-star, can't-miss, Arch Manning, Quinn Ewers, Texas prospect. But we're going to get those three-star, low-four-star guys who fit our scheme, who might be a little bit undervalued by the A&Ms and the Texases of the world. And lastly, this is just who he is. Um, he's a person that people relate to, that people connect with. Um, and that's not just 18- to 22-year-old guys. It's parents and it's fellow coaches. So that was a point of emphasis for him. I remember visiting him there and asking him that same question. He said, Paul, I'm from Texas. And I said, uh, are, are you sure? He goes, no, I live in Texas. I'm a Texan. I'm from Texas. And that's what he really embraced, that if he was at Texas, in Texas, he was a Texan. And that's who he was. He didn't try to, you know, recreate the wheel or have people adjust to what he wanted to do. He, he was in Rome and decided, when in Rome, I need to be a Texan. So that kind of thing, whether you're in Texas or California or New York or at Penn State, it's universal. People and relationships are universal. And I think that forms the bedrock of, how he relates to coaches and the parents. Well, Paul, we really have to talk about this move to the Carolina Panthers. They're, they're paying him very handsomely to not coach for them. And uh, my, my question to you is, do you think he still has that hunger to, to come back down to college football, especially a place like Nebraska, 
where there's going to be significant rebuilding need? Or is this a guy who, who might want to kick his feet up and enjoy getting a few months off and maybe getting himself an easier role somewhere in football next season as opposed to a, 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 such a big job like the Nebraska head coaching job is going to be? Yeah, that's definitely something to consider. I, I think how I can phrase this. There absolutely was and has been a time for Matt Rule where Nebraska would have been a job that he took. Absolutely, 100%. 100%. I can't say for sure that that is still the case right now, but I do know from a perspective of his mentality or, or the perspective of what it takes to be an elite-level coach in the college level, these guys don't want to sit it out. They don't want to be on Fox Sports doing a chucklehead morning show where they're laughing at clips. They, they don't want to do that. Most guys don't, and Matt Rule is not conditioned to be that way. There's also these other factors. There are guys that he's worked with his entire career who rely on him. He wants to give those guys jobs. He wants to continue you know, feeding these guys who have helped him become the coach that he is today. So a lot of factors go into play. I don't think he wants to sit out. Would he sit out if, if he couldn't get what he felt was the perfect or the right job? Yeah. But I do think that he's evaluating options now to get right back into the college game. If the opportunity is right for him to get back in the college, his reputation is almost peerless or impeccable uh, as a college coach. And, and I do think that it, it's, it would behoove him to get right back onto the horse. And I know he'll have his opportunity. If not at Nebraska, um, I promise you another big-time program will hire him and not have any regrets. How do you think the Nebraska job rates compared to what's open or what may open from a recruiting-based standpoint? I ask that because Temple's in Philly. We know how rich the state of Pennsylvania is with in-state talent. We, we cover high school football here, so there's been a – a, su- a surge in, in talent, and there's been schools from all Power Fives that have come in this state the last three years or so, and there's more to come to, to, to pluck Nebraska kids. Uh, so with Nebraska, is it lower on the rung? Would it be compared to a Georgia Tech in the Atlanta Metro or an Auburn and their history if, if Auburn opens up? Arizona State and uh, – the ability to go to California, Colorado, uh, in Boulder. I know they've been down a while, but where does Nebraska stand on this college football playing field in your eyes? Yeah, the five that are open right now, I mean, you have to think Arizona State's the easiest to recruit to because, you know, like you said, you can go into Southern California. The academic standards are not very high. You can bounce back kids. You can get JUCOs and, and, and all that. But the landscape has changed dramatically with NIL. So I think Nebraska is in a spot where if you can recruit Omaha well, and I think for Rule, just as an example, recruiting Philadelphia, as he did very well, uh, is in a, in, a, in a way prepares you for what it means to recruit schools in Omaha. Um, so I do think that's a little bit of a benefit for him. But, uh, yeah, I think Nebraska as a program needs someone who is not just going to swing and miss at big kids out in California or kids down in Florida, but is really going to do – advanced homework and it, and, it, and it reminds me a lot more of a chris peterson who is at washington recruiting approach which is you evaluate fit you evaluate character and then you evaluate forgettability and i think rule as a staff proved at temple and baylor that he first kind of looks at where does he fit on the roster how does he fit a need and then you begin to think about does he fit us from a cultural or from a mental or an emotional perspective and it's not wasteful i think it's very purposeful and very direct um, so I don't think that it's a one-year flip in terms of being able to turn over the roster, though it's easier than ever with the transfer portal. Uh, I just think that it's someone and, and a staff that would be more careful in terms of how they recruit to Nebraska than just kind of recruiting four stars and five stars. That can be frustrating, but I think when you see his track record of a second year and then a third year just leap and a rocket into the top 25, it would pay to be patient, whatever program you are, and let him get his guy because the track record speaks for itself. Paul Meyerberg, a couple more minutes with us. Hail Varsity Radio USA Today. His thoughts on Matt Rule now uh, potentially looking for work or counting his money uh, from the NFL. Mickey Joseph has re-energized this football program, just got done with Mickey's presser today. What's, what's your impression uh, of, of Mickey's tryout, how that's been going for him? Yeah, I think it's gone really well, and I think it speaks for itself coming off the bye week after Oklahoma that they've come out with two wins, especially Friday night, a uh, game I was able to catch because it was the only game in town. Um, <laughs> being down 13 nothing at the half, I think for Nebraska fans who watched the team, that's, that's an old story, and I think a lot of people could have predicted in the past how it would have unfolded in the second half. So um, in terms of energy, enthusiasm, uh, a simplification of things, and just kind of a streamlining of, of that's 
focus on Saturdays, ignore the noise, and be ourselves, he's been a smashing success. Uh, there's no doubt to me that he's a candidate for the job, and I think anyone who has watched him and, uh, and obviously knows how much respect he has within the state knows that he's a candidate for the job. Um, I don't know what the win total would be to force his hand for Trev Alberts to make that hire. I, I wouldn't even think to guess. My feeling on it is that Mickey Joseph is an outstanding coach who a lot of programs would want to have. If there's a way for Nebraska to hire a Matt Rule or to hire uh, whatever name you want to throw out there, a Lance Bipold or a Chris Kleiman, and keep Mickey Joseph in state and have him be someone who coaches your receivers, contributes on offense, does your recruiting coordination, that would be a home run. I just, it's a fantastic story. Anytime an interim coach works his way up the ladder and gets a shot specifically at his alma mater, I just don't want to put the pressure on him that he needs to go five and two or whatever to keep the job. I just think that it's, there are slim chances of him getting the job as there are any interim coach. He'd have to really, really, you know, put together a record and a resume that would include a division championship and a trip to the top of title game. I think to really be a serious guy down the line. If you're putting your top three together again, we're playing Trev Alberts here for a moment. Uh, you've got rule there. Uh, who else do you like that has been mentioned? If, if you were to put a hierarchy together. Yeah. I, I, it's hard now because they're playing so poorly. But I am a fan of Matt Campbell. I mm-hmm. do think he's someone who, like Rule, is has a blueprint and has a has a set plan for how to win football games and how to build a program. Um, I think he has that enthusiasm and youth and energy that Trev Alberts is looking for. So I, I do think that's someone to watch. And look, you can't have this conversation and talk about this opening without talking about Lance Leipold mm-hmm. because of what he's done at Kansas, the fact that he's very gettable, uh, the fact that it would be hard to turn down Nebraska money if it came to that. So I would say those three guys would be my top contenders realistically at this point. Um, what's going to complicate or could muddy things is what if Jim Leonard, you know, he goes six and six and Wisconsin enters the mix. They probably have a better shot at life pole than Nebraska does. Uh, what happens if Iowa State goes four and eight? Is Campbell no longer a candidate? What happens then? Who's your one B? So there are things that could really unfold these next few weeks that either bring clarity or muddy the waters a bit. But just in the vacuum, those would be my top three. It would be rule number one with the bullet, then Campbell, and then Michael. Weekend of college football, Paul, is Bama in trouble? Uh, Seven-and-a-half-point favorite. Tennessee looks really, really tough. They're in major trouble if Bryce Young can't go, and that's not breaking news. You just had to watch them on Saturday with Jalen Milrow under center. Milrow is a fantastic athlete. He brings a dimension to that offense that you don't get to see too much with Young, that he has run more this season. Uh, but, look, four turnovers, um, points in bunches left on the field because of four decisions on third down. I mean, this offense with Young under center might score 40 in that game, not 24. If Young's playing, I like Alabama. Uh, my feeling is that he probably could have gone last week and will go on Saturday. But if he doesn't, and it's Milrow against Hendon Hooker, uh, you have to like the ball. Because even though Alabama's got this long and expensive track record of getting it done on defense, especially in the secondary, I'm not sure we live in an environment right now, and certainly not for this specific team in 2022 October, that they're just going to hold Tennessee to 13 points. I don't think that's going to happen. I think they're going to need to get to the 30s to beat them. They can do that with Young. I don't think they'll do that with Milrow. Michigan, Penn State. Uh, Penn State's just kind of been under the radar. Really good football team. Michigan has looked uh, tough as well. I got a bit of a scare from Indiana. That's going to be big in the big house. Yeah, you know, it's weird. I think Penn State, like you said, they are underrated and they're overlooked. I think the same of Michigan. Uh, part of me feels that Michigan has been playing with its food a bit um, and they could just, like, you know, peel back their shirt and show off a little bit of Superman. I, I do think they've got another gear that they can hit, and I do think they find that on Saturday. Penn State's a good team. I think they're a New Year's Six team if it plays out right, and their only two losses are Michigan and Ohio State. I think Michigan is at a different level, and, and I really think they start to show that on Saturday. Paul Meyerberg with us, USA Today College Football. Paul, awesome to chat. Thanks for your insight. Of course, guys. Talk again soon. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, Hale Varsity. We're presented by Currency. Let's get the lowdown on Purdue and the rest of the Big Ten. Tom Deanhard with us is... He is writer and editor, blackandgold.com. You know him from Rivals and Yahoo Sports. Tom, big one in West Lafayette. How are we feeling? Yeah, it ought to be very interesting. Both teams obviously coming in with some momentum. Nebraska with two wins in a row. Purdue with three wins in a row. Both, uh, And, of course, Purdue's last two wins came on the road as an underdog. So 
again, uh, each team sitting atop the Big Ten West along with Illinois. So the stakes stakes are pretty high Saturday night when these teams will face off. No, it's going to be a fun ball game. Where has Purdue grown? What 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 enabled them? Great win at, at Maryland, uh, and, and of course, just stout defense against Minnesota. Where where and why have they jumped to where they're at since since Syracuse? Well, you know, getting Aiden O'Connell healthy has been a big part of it. Of course, he uh, he got hurt in the Syracuse game on September seventeenth. He was hurt in the first quarter, believed to be a rib injury. He missed the next game. Purdue had to fight and crawl to get a 28-26 win versus Florida Atlantic. And O'Connell started the last two games, and he still really isn't 100%. He's getting closer, though, guys. Minnesota, he was really off last weekend in Maryland. He was better. And, again, just given the the, the function of time here, uh, he should be more healed up and more like his old self. And, boy, this offense needs a quarterback that can throw the ball downfield like O'Connell. So that's been the real key of late is just having him refine his groove. How how healthy is Purdue? You just mentioned O'Connell, right? And he's getting back to, to full strength. But you had Jones, you have uh, Downing, you're, you're running back, and, of course, your right tackle. Uh, how wounded is, is Purdue, or does it matter? Have, have the backups performed pretty well so far? Yeah, everybody's getting banged up at this time of year. Purdue will be without its top two running backs. You know, King Daru began the season as the number one back. He only played the first two games and has been out since with a calf injury, not expected to play Saturday night. In his absence, Purdue had to turn to two walk-on running backs. One of those, Dylan Dowling, will be out, sadly, with a foot injury. So he will be down to Devin Mockaby, redshirt freshman, running back, a walk-on, who they, who they like a lot. He's been pretty productive. And, you know, uh, they've got a transfer from Central Michigan named Kobe Lewis, and they have Tyrone Tracy, the former Iowa wide receiver. They're going to use him more as a running back. Uh, so, again, that, that's sort of the situation that you talked about. You know, the offensive line, they lost their second right tackle to a season in an injury. Depth's getting real thin there. They only have six linemen they really trust to play, so they can't afford much more attrition there. And honestly, defensively, um, they should be in pretty good shape. They got Jalen Graham back last week, their best defensive player in this four games. So that was a big boost to that defense. So by and large, for this being the seventh game, Purdue isn't in terrible shape. Tom, tell me a little bit about the mood surrounding this this Purdue football team right now. Because with Nebraska, it was a case of everything that could go wrong did go wrong early in the season. But now Husker fans are looking at the Big Ten West saying, well, Nebraska's tied for the lead in the Big Ten West. And maybe this game on Saturday is an elimination game for, for who is going to still be in contention for a Big Ten West crown. Can you tell me what the mood is like around this Purdue football team? Are they thinking about that game in the same way? Oh, no doubt. And that Big Ten West, like you said, looks like it's wide open. Iowa and Wisconsin already have two league losses, I believe, and um, talked about Nebraska, Purdue, and Illinois all being tied at the top. You know, we can scratch Northwestern, I think. So, And then there's Minnesota, too, with the one league loss. They were off last week. They have a big game this weekend at, at Illinois. It's going to be fascinating. So, yeah, it's, I mean, again, you, you could stand in front of the, the masses and make a case for or four or five of these teams to win the West and not get laughed off the stage. So, yeah, both Nebraska and Purdue certainly have to think at this point, mid-October, that they have, they have as good a chance as anybody to win that West. So it's going to be fun to watch this this whole race play out. Tom Deanhart with us, Hale Varsity Radio, goldenblack.com is where you read Tom Deanhart at, Tom Deanhart1. It's where you follow him on Twitter. What's your take on Nebraska? You've always kept an eye on Lincoln. You've come to Lincoln every year. You've even been for a few spring games. I know you like steak, bud, (laughs) but but some of the football has been tough to watch. So what do you think of Mickey so far in this interim role? You know, I give him credit. Not an easy situation. And uh, that program looked like it was circling the drain fast. Uh, And uh, then he gets the job and, and they get hammered by Oklahoma. Then he has to fire the defensive coordinator but they've rallied, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, they got the two wins. I know Indiana and Rutgers aren't exactly juggernauts, but still, a win is a win, and, and, and you, you got to give Nebraska credit for keeping things together. And that, that defense under Bill Bush is playing a lot better as well. Just, just kind of sounds like they simplified things, and they're tackling better as well. I know they've got their warts, 
secondary's got some issues. The offensive line, the tackle spot. Um, I know overall the defense still looks like it's vulnerable, but I give Nebraska credit for keeping this thing on track when it really could have gone off the rails by the end of, of, of September, you know. So still a long season to go, and who knows? I mean, you guys watch football like I do. Crazy things happen every Saturday. I know they're about a 13-point underdog here in ross Eight Stadium, but like I said, that the, the things things fall crazy for, for the Huskers and against Purdue. Maybe they can walk out here with a W. That's my question. Here is let's let's flip it around. What what's got to happen? Where where's Purdue vulnerable? Nebraska's just been so choppy on the offensive line. They've got some dudes, you know, at running back yeah. and at wide out. And Casey's been been a gamer, and the defense is better, but. Where what scares you about Nebraska matchup wise against Purdue, and flip it around? What what's what's dangerous for Nebraska as they head in with Purdue? Yeah, Nebraska's got that big three on offense, right? Trey Palmer from LSU and Anthony Grant, from Florida State, uh, JC uh, Kid, and of course Casey Thompson mm-hmm. from Texas. They can do some damage. Uh, Purdue has been vulnerable in the past game. Teams that hit big passes against them. At times, the, the DBs struggle to cover. They get grabbed. They get PIs. So that's been one issue for them. But the one thing they've done really well all year on defense is stop the run. So uh, they've yet to allow a 100-yard rusher this year. They're the only Big Ten team that's allowed just one run of over 20 yards. So they don't get gassed with big plays in the ground game either. So here comes Anthony Grant. I know he's number four in the Big Ten of rushing. He'll be the next challenge. So. Um, again, I think if, if you're going to get Purdue, you got to probably try to pass the ball, hit some plays downfield. Now, I will say this. The last two weeks, guys, Bruce had six turnovers combined, three against Minnesota, three against the Maryland. And here's, here's what's incredible. Of those six turnovers, the opposing teams only scored three points. Wow. So the defense has really responded to those sudden changes, too. Uh, and, you know, I guess if you're a Nebraska fan for, and you're playing Purdue's offense, you always got to worry about the pass, right? Mm-hmm. Most teams are playing Purdue too deep, trying to keep things in front of them. No big pass plays. Make Purdue be patient. Take the underneath stuff and dare Purdue to run the football. So I imagine Nebraska will take a similar tact. Uh, the run game is always very pedestrian. But if you're going to dare Purdue to run, they will take their chances and try to set their play action up. So, um, they've got some playmakers. Watch Charlie Jones, number 15, the former Iowa receiver. He's not 100% either, though, guys. He rarely practices. The uh, last three games, he really hasn't shined. Uh, he's looking for a breakout, and he's a guy that if he gets behind you, he can go the distance. Tom Deanhart is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Tom, quickly, I was just going to say that the, the best way to beat this Nebraska team is A, win the turnover battle, and B, get after Casey Thompson. So I want to ask about Purdue's pass rush. How are they doing since losing a guy like George Karloftis to the draft? He, he was a phenomenal talent last year, gave Nebraska a lot of problems. Well, what does Purdue have in that pass rush this year that, that Nebraska fans should be looking out for? No Karloftis, that's for sure. Just a lot of capable bodies. That's the strength of the defense. Um, they go about 10, 12 deep. They keep bodies fresh. They rotate a lot. Keeps them good in the second half. Uh, they got a couple guys emerging as pass rushers. Watch number 96, Corday Sidner, redshirt freshman, had two sacks last week. He looks like he could be a cut above. And the other end, number 44, Kydron Jenkins, probably is their best pass rusher. But again, nobody's really stepped up as being that wow guy. Those are two players to watch who could maybe develop into that type of a difference maker. The pass rush has gotten better week by week, and they, they don't always get the sacks, but, but I know they, they like the pressures they get to try to impact the quarterbacks, and it's getting better week by week. Tom Deanhart covers Purdue for Rivals, and uh, follow him on Twitter at Tom Deanhart one goldenblack.com. So is there going to be a, a little sadness with no frost on the sideline for Coach Brom? <laughs> I don't know about that. It's crazy. I was thinking this is Brom's sixth year, and this would be the third Nebraska coach he's faced off against. If you remember 2017, Jeff's first year, Mike Riley was the coach. Mm-hmm. And they actually came here, and when Nebraska won on like the last play of the game, it was a wild game. And uh, in 2019, Purdue had a comeback. That was an Aiden O'Connell comeback. He came off the bench. One of our first glimpses of him. No idea he would develop into what he has developed. And then 2020, Nebraska was in West Lafayette, a COVID game. Nobody was in the stands. Huskers got out of here with a W. So it's been a fun, competitive series, at least the last five to six years. 
Oh, they, they've always been pretty crazy ball games, a lot of points. Purdue's been great at Memorial Stadium. I mean, they've had a couple of touchdown wins, or or last year they, they picked off Adrian four times, and it's been uh, the inability for Nebraska in, in Ross Aid to, to hang on, except for the, the Riley game and, of course, the – the uh, the COVID year, but it, it's been a real struggle for Nebraska. I just know that there was a little fi- a little extra fire uh, with the former head coach here for for Purdue when they face him. That was a feel, anyway, Tom. <laughs> I'd, I'd I'd love to see those guys square off in a little uh, a little uh, boxing match. Uh, two 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 tough guys uh, who give no quarter to anybody. So you know what, Nebraska's coming into town. They, they've got nothing to lose, right? Mm-hmm. And they've got absolutely nothing to lose. To me, I think they're still playing with house money at this point. So you can have, you can let it let let loose a little bit, have some fun, and play pressure free through the Huskers. I think the pressure is on Purdue as a double digit home underdog, even though Nebraska's won two in a row. Sometimes that's a nice place to be. Uh, so for again, Nebraska, like I said, it's just it's just nice for the fan base to see Mickey kind of rally the troops there, keep that that like I said that program on track. And still relevant here as, as we get to the midway point of, of October. Tom, last thought here, about 15 seconds. As a guy who covers Purdue, how does that 14-point line strike you? Seems a little high to me. I thought maybe 10. We'll see where we end up come kickoff on Saturday. Um, I'm not sure Purdue's 13 to 14 points better than Nebraska. Um, Vegas always knows a heck of a lot more than I do, though. <laughs> but we'll, 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 we'll see if this gets bedded down at all. Tom, take care, bud. Thanks for the insight, as always. All right, be good, fellas. Good to spend time with Tom Dean Hart with us. Hail Varsity Radio presented by Currency. Reminder to get buckled up, hands on the wheel, eyes in mind. Straight ahead, the driver's got one job to drive a message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Five good minutes. Husker left guard Ethan Piper next on Hail Varsity. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. Ethan Piper's with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Ethan, two in a row. How's it feel? Feels good. It feels really good. I think uh, we're starting to build confidence and starting to believe that we can do some good things on the football field. So it's a, it's a good feeling to be 2-0. and Coach Joseph was talking about uh, halftime, and was there quite a bit of confidence about a comeback opportunity as you guys were yeah. going over the first half? Yeah, definitely. We, uh, we as a unit, especially on the offense, um, we we didn't stop uh, believing. We 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 kept we kept uh, saying, "Hey, we got this." It doesn't matter what the scoreboard says. It's like the only thing we could do is do our thing, and we have to believe that we're going to win this game. And uh, that was our goal: just score one more point. And it happened, and it might have been, been the most pretty thing, but we still got the dub. So it was a great great feeling to just keep getting bought in. So, can you talk about the the grind that is very real in the Big Ten, where? gritty more so than pretty but the reality of it four quarters in a big 10 game yeah definitely big 10 is just kind of a slug fest out there it's like you got you take a lot of body blows and um it just comes down to who wants more at the end it's like it doesn't matter it just matters about your mindset throughout the entire game if you're willing to uh outwill the guy in front of you uh eventually good things will happen so few minutes here, Ethan Piper with, with us, Hale Varsity Radio. Tell us uh, about your story here, your time in, in Lincoln, and uh, your perseverance, uh, the ability to keep climbing the ladder, uh, and uh, this, this O-line. Uh, what's special about this O-line? You know, I think the, the most special thing about the O-line right now is we're just a bunch of guys. There's been a lot of just changes, as people know, the offense line, but I, we haven't blinked. It's just it's been, we've been constantly, doesn't matter who's playing next to us, we've been always saying, hey, what have we got? Like, we're, we're, we're here together. It's not any individuals out there as one unit. And kind of just my story is that, um, yeah, and things in the past haven't gone probably the way it is, but um, that's just kind of how life is. You got to take what opportunities are given to you and uh, make the best out of them. And um, for me, it's just like every single day I come out of here, it's a blessing. And you never view it as a, it's, it's, it's an opportunity. It's never a setback or anything. It's just like how uh, I'm super lucky to be playing here at Nebraska. So. Let's talk about Coach Raiola and uh, and his mentality and where have you seen the progression happen with the unit mm-hmm. since uh, since Ireland? You know, Coach Raiola, he's a man. Like we're we're lucky to have him. He he is a guy that 
is very committed to the team and very committed to the offensive line. And I think what he just brings is the intensity and enthusiasm that uh, to the game. And he brings it day in and day out, and it's contagious. And I think uh, we're starting to learn as an offensive line that um, just you can come out and just start believing that you're going to get the guy a pancake. You just got to have that enthusiasm every play and just like – we got to just play for each other and just have passion in the game. And I think that's been a, a big turning point and that we're starting to more, realize more and more. So, What do you love about the offense, uh, the balance of it, and just what, what can this offense do? You know, I, I really love our offense, especially with Mark Whipple, an offense coordinator. I think he's got a lot of experience, and I – he, he's seen the game for how many years? So he he's always got uh, he's always putting us in the best looks and um, a lot a lot of like uh, knows how to handle certain situations. So I have full confidence and uh, very lucky to have him, especially as offense offense coordinator. So is momentum real in in uh, college football? Yeah, one thousand percent momentum. Like I said, it's. It's it's a momentum game. It's like if once you get your juices flowing, it's like you got, you make plays that you don't even think you could make. And that's it's not it's like I said, it's all about believing and passion. That's what football is. That's why in high school, like you have these kids that you, they're not might be the most physically fit guys, but they're making extraordinary plays. And a special teams, there's guys making extraordinary plays. On it's just like you 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 like play outside your boundaries when you start getting that belief and confidence. So. Take me through the process of communication on the offensive line, be it uh, third down or some different looks you guys get. How does the game of telephone go? You know, um, uh, we are expected to know every single look, and um, we are supposed to be able to, like most of the time uh, the center makes the call, but we should every person on the offensive line should make a call. We're, we always say seeing through one set of eyes. We should be able to see through and recognize everything and be able to communicate with each other. But it's it's not a communication like we should already know the look and like just like, oh, yeah, this is the look. Like, here, here we go. Like, this is what's going on. It's not like trying to like you're like try to figure it out on the field. You already you already know what's going on. So it's not like that big of a communication because we already handled the work earlier in the week. So. Tell me a little bit about Grant and, and the running back stables, how, how the, the progress has been working together, uh, getting the run game going. You know, Anthony Grant, he's a special dude. And um, I always say this, like, we as an offensive line are very lucky to have him in the backfield. And um, for us, it's just more motivation because knowing we have a guy like that in the backfield, that makes our job even more important. And um, just to get him going, you saw the hit. That Like, man, it's just... He, just, he plays at a different speed than everybody else. So um, it's, we, that's a challenge for us is to get him going because once we get him going, then things will open up in the pass game and stuff. So, a couple of minutes here, Ethan Piper with us, Hale Varsity Radio ahead of Purdue. Uh, let's talk about Casey and what he brings to the table. You know, Casey's a great guy. He's very genuine, very uh, – he's, he's a great player, but overall, like, just being around him is fun to be around. And um, just that he brings that uh, – community that we have as an offense it brings everybody together and I think uh, um, if you trust somebody off the field you're going to trust them on the field so um, man it's just, it's just good to have Casey in the backfield for us so when he took you guys out to eat who did the most damage you know <laughs> I think everybody did a, a size yeah, chunk of damage. Anybody at. you know it, it just started coming out that we, we it just we just kept buying food because you know it's but I don't know. I think everybody did about equal about it, amount of damage. It was it was a good time and it was a big it was a big meal. So, Ethan, last thought here. Uh, your take on Purdue? Uh, you faced them before. You've been in in uh, West Lafayette before. And uh, what's the challenge here Saturday night? You know, it's just another game. You know, we got to treat them like anybody else. We had we we have to give them the respect they have, and uh, we got to come out and um, really just. Um, really give it to them and that's the biggest thing is just treat it like any other game um it's going to be a bit big crowd supposedly and we just got to know that this is a, a big pivotal game for us so ethan best of luck thank you no thank you there he is ethan piper left guard really good story for ethan to, to persevere keep battling uh very physical on that left side uh, stepped in and uh played well uh for nebraska and, yeah, it's another ball game. So this is a tweet that's out there, things that 
Tennessee fans have never done after an Alabama game. Sent an instant message after beating Alabama. Posted on Instagram after beating Alabama. Gotten an Uber after beating Alabama. Stream Netflix. What did they do? I haven't seen this movie. Forgive me. They did get to rent Nacho Libre. You haven't seen Nacho Libre? No. Is that that Jack- tweet's funny, but that, that, is that, that is, movie is... Is that Jack Black? Yes. I've seen like the character. He's like a wrestler, right? Yeah, it's probably his greatest work. Even better than School of Rock? Better than School of Rock. Nacho Libre is up there. That's a great movie. You the need to add it to your list. time... Alabama lost to Tennessee. I'm sure Phil Fulmer was stomping around the sideline, but uh, Tennessee fans could rent Nacho Libre at a blockbuster. I'm still upset you haven't seen that movie. All right, talk to me. Have you seen Animal House? Yes, of course. Okay, wrong guy. We'll wind down to Tuesday next on Hail Varsity. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time, be sure to get the podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Hail Varsity Radio, also on YouTube, the Hail Varsity channel. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency. Mitch Sherman's totally awesome. Great stuff with him today. Love hearing his take on Matt Rule and also Nebraska Purdue. Good stuff from Paul Meyerberg, USA Today College Football Insider. He has uh, is extensive coverage of Matt Rule, so you got uh, plenty of rule uh, today. And then Tom Deanhart talked Nebraska-Purdue, and then Ethan Piper with us. So, it went, uh, listen, I don't care where you're at, what aisle you're on politically, but Ben Sass and the University of Florida, it was a bleep show for him yesterday. And you kind of knew that going in. He was going to take it on the chin. If you're... If you're Ben Sass, would you have rocked your uh, your Nebraska Fiesta Bowl sweatshirt, sixty two twenty four? No. S- <laughs> simply put, listen, you're just going to get all sorts of hell anyway from a thousand people screaming at you. Might as well walk in with your Nebraska over Florida sweatshirt. Just divert the attention, make them hate you for your Nebraska your affiliation tank. as opposed to your political opinions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're sad, you should have just walked in with the old Tostitos Fiesta Bowl shirt or sweatshirt. Yeah, come to Hale Varsity Radio for all your public relations needs. We'll get you right. <laughs> or or not. <laughs> let's, uh, l- let's get an update here. <laughs> that is the sound. Okay, okay. So... My kid has many nicknames. Most of the time you know him as Junior. Occasionally he's the monkey. And if he's making me a drink, it's Jeeves. Okay? Some crazy monkey sound. I know, but I love the chimp sound effect. Like, he was a little kid, he'd always, like, jump on my back in the pool and he said, take me around. I was like, all right, you dirty sea monkey. That's where it spawns from. Got his car last night. Carl, love you. Thank you. But, um... I don't know. We're going to set an over under here. We don't. We aren't even going to check with our friends in Vegas. How soon till he's grounded from his car? That is the question. He's the type of guy that's going to leave a window down and it's going to rain in it because he'll park it outside. I'm praying we're, we're giving him a shot here for some responsibility. But got his car last night. It's in the garage. Uh, he will be confused for a female because his hair's too long. Got to get that tightened up. But it works. I like it. I'm happy for him. Such a dad thing to say. We got to get him a haircut. Well, <laughs> get <laughs> off of my yard. The, the, uh, the question is, though, are you going, you in liability or are you going full coverage? Oh, dude. There's not enough money to put down for full coverage for him. But as a 16-year-old driver. Oh, I'm, I'm saying what, whatever. Is it a worthwhile investment? Big time. We're calling Bolty up and saying, dude, what do we got to do here to make sure everybody's all right? Take his keys. I know that's the answer. <laughs> but for the most part, no. It was a pretty good day. He doesn't turn 16 until the, uh, the 10th of, uh, of November, but almost well, a little less than a month away. So get the podcast, get things checked out. 
Meyerberg and Sherman must listen to for sure. Tommy Deanhart, awesome. Tomorrow, Evan Bland with us. Mike Babcock, Mike Shuhart. And uh, we'll be back at you at 4 with Hale Varsity, presented by Currency.